So hitting into the 2000s, everyone thought they were going to die or something. I don't know, something about computers forgetting who they were and everything breaking and being thrown back into the Stone Age. All very tinfoil hat stuff. Sure enough, it didn't happen. But what we did get was a very interesting decade of Formula One, full of legends and incredible moments and tire blowouts and traction control and groove tires. Okay, maybe not all of it was amazing, but looking at the grid back in those days was pretty astounding. And when you look back and try and rank the drivers from that period, it's nigh on impossible. What do you want to do? Save a box of kittens or save a box of puppies? <laughs> Don't make me choose! But without wishing to get woefully off topic here, and seeing as how it's been a while since I did the last one, I figured to move into the twilight of the series and rank the 10 best Formula 1 drivers of the 2000s. Now, I feel the need to mention a thing or two here, because even I got a bit angsty at a couple of my choices on this list. Basically, I'm taking the whole decade into account. What I mean by that is that a driver who's done one or two seasons in the 2000s will probably have less of a chance as someone who has stuck around for the entirety of it. Sometimes, achievements will outweigh a driver's pace, and vice versa. Hey look, this list is entirely opinion based. No sh Sherlock. So don't take it to heart if you disagree with it. Just comment your top 10 list down below so I could be in the YouTube algorithm's good books for another week. Capiche? Right on. So first we'll dig into the honorable mentions and oh boy, there are some big cookies in this one. There was Nick Heidfeld, an extraordinary driver who probably has about half a dozen less victories than he deserved. Nico Rosberg, in the days before he jumped ship to Mercedes, putting in some bloody good performances in the Williams before the decade was out. Ralph Schumacher, a very good driver for the likes of Toyota and Williams in this decade before he went on to become Jacques Villeneuve's successor in Time Magazine's Loudmouth of the Year Award. Robert Kubica, who is quite handy in the BMW Sauber. I'm going to hell, aren't I? David Coulthard, who is much better than people may think or remember him to be, and also helped lay some of the foundations down for the Red Bull team to be what it is today. And lastly, Mika Hakkinen. Okay, please. I know that some people are going to be asking for my head for putting him in the honorable mentions ward, but him only being in the first two years of the decade makes it a tad hard to put him in the 10. Besides, it's not as if it makes him bad or anything. It's just how these rankings work on this channel because it's run like a dictatorship. Probably not a good thing in hindsight. Anyways, as always, we're not going to start with number one on this list. Rather, we'll start with one. Pablo Montoya. I had to make that joke, don't f***ing kill me. Montoya was menacingly fast on a racetrack, and he had proven that long before he entered the world of Formula 1. After having set the American open wheel scene alight, Formula 1 team boss and pro wheelchairist Frank Williams offered him a gig in his team. Not a stupid idea given the success he had with Jacques Villeneuve. And while Montoya looked at fitness in the same way that Megan the Stallion's entourage looked at Martin Brundle, oh, my father would hear about that. his ability behind the wheel shone through, especially in those epic battles with Michael Schumacher, but broke through with a win at Monza in 2001. For the next two years, he would stamp his authority at Williams and was in close contention for the title in 2003. But then the Warris car happened and then he went to McLaren. And although he would achieve three wins at McLaren, making it seven victories overall in his relatively short F1 career, he's still fondly remembered to this day. Some even as amongst the best who have never won the world championship. Someone else you could feasibly put into that argument was fellow South American and Ferrari slave man, Rubens Barrichello. When you think Rubens Barrichello, some of you are probably going to be thinking Michael Schumacher's wingman, which kind of sucks because there was more to this guy than 2002 Austria. Replacing Eddie Irvine at Ferrari in 2000, he was always meant to be on a hiding to nothing. But that didn't stop him from achieving some fine results. He achieved 11 wins throughout his career, most of them at Ferrari, but some of them at the Braun outfit in 2009. Whilst he couldn't match Jensen in his time there, he still managed to achieve decent results for sure. And although he was always branded as Schumacher's mule at Ferrari, his 9 wins and 13 pole positions in the 2000s demonstrated his skill. One particular example being at the 2003 British Grand Prix, a performance that I'm pretty sure, even by the more lax standards of the time, wasn't meant to be shown before the watershed. His time at Honda was a little bit of a down period, but you can't expect much from him when the car is going slower than the supposed B team at the time. But I mean, hey, losing to a B team driver wasn't the most alien thing to happen back then. Mark Webber experienced that sh back in 2008. Not that it meant Webber was a bad driver, he definitely wasn't. When he entered the scene back in 2002, not many people would have predicted he'd get points or anything. I mean, for crying out loud, he was in a Minardi. It was about as state of the art as Equio's fleet. But after half the grip blew up on the first corner, and after Mika Salo crumpled under the pressure of battling for fifth place with a Minardi, Webber got points on debut and became the first Aussie to score points in his home Grand Prix. At least, I think he was. And of course, whilst he couldn't do much of anything in that team, he went over to Jaguar, then to Williams, with some amount of success, I suppose. And by that, I mean he got one podium in 2005. But both these teams had completely died in the ass in terms of their former glory. He was then snapped up by Red Bull for 2007, and by 2009, it seemed to all work out for him getting his first victory at the Nürburgring later that year. More success would follow in the 2010s, but for what it was worth, and how he performed relative to his teammates, this was a pretty decent effort all round. And that debut in 2002 
2 really was a thing of beauty, especially compared to the other debutants in that race, who retired in an orgy of smoke and coolant. Ah yes, that poor Salva didn't fare too well, that's for sure. But in the races after that, Felipe Massa did pretty well, despite being replaced by Heinz Harold Frentzen in 2003 for some reason, he would return to the team for 2004 and 05, performing valiantly and asserting himself as a genuine talent. And that was great for him because in 2006, he was given his big break at Ferrari, replacing Rubens Barrichello. He was now going to be the teammate of Michael Schumacher, and oh boy, that's a hell of a teammate to have. But you know, he did good. Winning his first Grand Prix in Turkey that year, and also winning at Interlagos in front of his home crowd in a Ferrari, which is just about as good as life can possibly get. He also had a good season in 2007, despite the indomitable Kimi Raikkonen and having been signed on to be his teammate. But 2008 was where he would put forth a serious claim for the title. He drove so bloody well that year and was briefly world champion before Timo Glock's endeavour to walk on water backfired. But with another win at Interlagos, as well as a further five wins that year alone to accompany it, Massa was admired by everyone for being a damn good driver. And had that German decided to defy the laws of physics and avoid becoming a meme, would have been a very worthy world champion indeed. On the subject of that race actually, someone who helped Massa almost become champion was a dude who would eventually become champion himself. Now, me putting Sebastian Vettel this low on the list is gonna horrify some people, but let me clarify for the next couple people on this list that their debuts in the decade were quite late. So that's all I'm gonna say on it. If you haven't got the picture by now, I don't know, slam your head on the desk or throw your phone out the window. Either one of them should do the trick. Anyway, Seb made his debut back in the 2007 United States Grand Prix, driving for the BMW Sauber team after Robert Kubica was injured in Montreal. In that race, he would become the youngest point scorer ever in what was a pretty good drive. Once Robert got better, however, Seb was taken out of the seat and back into oblivion. But then he was given another lifeline, when Scott Speed was given the old heave ho from Toro Rosso after fighting with an elderly fan, and thus gave Seb a full-time slot on the grid pretty much. That season's car didn't really allow him to do much of anything, but a fourth place finish in China after starting 17th was a remarkable result, although it wasn't quite as remarkable as his maiden win at Monza the following year. That newer Toro Rosso was definitely the goods, but Seb maximised its potential, and damn nearly played a hand in deciding the 08 title by planting his car ahead of the McLarens. After being promoted to Red Bull in 09, he began winning on a more consistent basis. He finished runner-up that year and oh boy, we probably weren't prepared for the beast that was about to come in the decade that followed. Ditto goes for the next dude on this list. Mr. Lewis Hamilton. We're all too used to the prospects of Lewis fighting for wins week in and week out. Probably because for virtually his entire career, that's just how it's been. Debuting in 2007 against the Lord of the Eyebrows, not a hell of a lot of people were expecting this guy to be pushing him against the ropes. But heading into the second to the last round that year in China, he was leading the standings by 12 points in a time where a win got you 10. He could have won the title that day, lest he found that one pit lane gravel trap in the entire world whilst driving on tyres that were worn down to the canvas. He lost his maiden title and his maiden year of Formula 1. I mean, it sounds gut-wrenching, but my god, man, that was a hell of a debut year. Arguably one of the greatest, best car or not. In 2008, he would get his maiden title, despite a few things that happened that year, putting in some absolutely Herculean performances, such as at Silverstone in the rain. And even in 2009, when the car was a bit of a heathen, he still found a way to win, because that's just what you would expect from a dude who was just that great behind the wheel. But of course, the car didn't quite match up to the brawn that year, which took Jensen Button to his first and only world title. Before that, Jensen was always regarded as a fantastic talent. His first season wasn't brilliant, but then again, judging off of one season is not the smartest thing in the world to do. You often need to give them a couple of years, or in some people's cases, five. He sort of bounced around from Williams to Benetton, then to BAR, and almost back to Williams again before contract doings prevented that. And that was strange, because in 2004, BAR had done pretty well and gave him a car which could score podiums on a consistent basis. In fact, after having scored no podiums preceding that season, he scored 10 that year. Fantastic then, maybe this will lead to bigger and better things, eh? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, nah, nah, not really. The team began to gradually decline, and despite scoring his maiden win in Hungary in 2006, the team began to drown in 07 and 08. Honda then pulled out of the sport, which at this stage was starting to become kinky for them, and left everyone in limbo. But when Ross Braun bought the team for a pound, and went into the preseason testing in 09, they knew they had something. And after winning six out of the first seven Grand Prix, it gave Button enough of a cushion to help him win the World Championship in 2009. It's remarkable that he held on to it, to be honest, especially with what the other teams began to to produce in the latter half of the year, although Ferrari were always kind of against the ropes that season, which was a little bit sad because they had Kimi Raikkonen that year, and Raikkonen was absolutely, undeniably, insanely, mesmerizingly fast. Debuting in 2001 for Sauber, he had shown his speed and immediately put himself in Ron Dennis's good
good books. Signing him up for McLaren in 2002, his success wasn't immediate, primarily because the damn thing was so unreliable, but by 2003, he got his first Grand Prix victory in Sepang. He didn't win anything else that year, but he came so close to winning the title, thanks to 11 million second place finishes that year. Had things gone differently, maybe he could have won the title. Nah. Coulda, woulda, shoulda. If Teo Fabi's hair didn't weigh him down, he could have been a 10-time world champion, but hey, here we are now. After his stint at McLaren, he went off to Ferrari for 2007 and immediately won the world championship after McLaren tore itself to pieces from the inside out. He won races for the remaining two years he had for the Scuderia at the time, before eventually deciding, nah, can't be asked with F1 anymore at the end of 2009 and bugged off to do rally and NASCAR. But for me, the season that embodied just how fast Kimi was, was the year 2005. Finishing second that year, it may seem a little little strange to put that above 2007, but there is a good reason why. There was no one, no one that year, that extracted more out of the car than he did. 2005 Kimi was scary fast. He won 7 races that year, and a total of 13 podiums in the 19 races held that year, if you want to count this one as a race. But Kimi's problem was that the car was still bloody unreliable. It was a huge shame, but you need only watch Kimi that season to understand why there is more to him than the lovable persona where he abhors the media and loves the drink. He's a great dude and hell of a driver, and probably 2005 driver of the year, even if the champion for that year was the Lord of the Eyebrows. Alright, for his sake, I'll stop calling him that now. Fernando Alonso entered Formula 1 with Minardi, and much like other people who joined that team, he couldn't do too much with it. After taking a year off, he was in with Renault, and immediately took a liking to being up the front, taking his first pole position in Sepang that year, and winning his first race in Hungary. His incredible ability behind the wheel needed a car to match, and in 2005, he got it. With the R25, he took his first world championship and would win again the following year to become a national hero in Spain. I think. His time at McLaren almost brought about another world title, but it definitely did just about require the entirety of the working outfit to undertake marriage counselling. He then went back to Renault, where things didn't really improve so much, but he definitely made hay with what he had, with a little bit of help from resident walking waterbed Flav. His championship in 2005 was, for some people at least, an absolute blessing because for the entirety of the 2000s up to that point, it was dominated by one man. As with the 1990s, this decade was topped by the one and only Michael Schumacher. From 2000 to 2004, Schumacher racked up five world titles, adding on to the previous two won in 94 and 95, even in years like 03, where he was able to ward off the likes of Montoya and Raikkonen. Yeah, crazy to think there was a time where more than one or two cars vied for the world title. Nah, radical concept. Shimmy continued to show why he was the man in Formula 1. His final season, or at least we thought it was his final season, in 2006 proved that even when he was about to bow out, that he was still going to go toe-to-toe with whoever it was to become champion of the world. Problem is, before he got a chance to do that, his engine noped on him in Japan. Still, he retired with 91 total wins, 7 world titles, and only one major controversy in this decade, an improvement over the 90s. This decade further added to the legend of the man, and why people, still to this day, regard Michael Schumacher as the greatest to have ever done it. But, you know, there ain't no goat. If there was one, it'd be this dude. The joke's old now, innit? Anyways, thank you all for watching. Drop a comment below, subscribe to the channel if you're awesome, and always remember, keep it respectful, be wholesome, don't be a manus, and as always, I'll see you all later.